matter of uh, introduction to subject matter, everybody, does everybody know what NumPy is? No. Okay, almost everybody, but I'll say it anyway, because that's the first slide, so I, I don't really have much choice. And I wouldn't skip it for my life. <laughs> so w w w what's NumPy? Uh, as the shortest explanation possible, really, really, is that it's a, uh, a library that extends Python with a new, uh, uh, new data type, uh, a multi-dimensional uh, multi arrays. I edited the sentence uh, right a few minutes ago and it doesn't make sense now, so please ignore. But the, the thing is though, the most, important, uh, the most important aspect of NumPy is that there's this Date, this x1 extra data type and ma matrices of numbers, basically, on which you can perform a variety of operations. So, basic operation on arrays, uh, linear algebra operations. So, that's a little bit towards MATLAB direction, right? Uh, Fourier transforms and uh, variety of random number generators. Uh, that's a uh, fairly mature library. It started with something that was called numeric, numere, and now it's NumPy. Uh, documentation is out there. It's, uh, its quality tends to be spotty, but there's a book which actually is rather good, and uh, since recently it's, uh, it's even free, or uh, should we say based on honor system, you pay if you feel like that. It's a downloadable, uh, downloadable uh, PDF by one of the authors. So it's, it's, uh, it's pretty much, uh, everything is there. And uh, it appears that, uh, as far as I'm concerned, it's been around since almost forever. So it is a pretty mature library that I went through a fair number of iterations. And it's, it's really, really nice. And I suggest it kind of, uh, really warmly to everybody. Um, now, the, why I said it's, a, it's a, the labor of love. If you, if you read this book, the, the manual or guide to uh, NumPy, it starts with, uh, okay, how, how is that we wrote it? And it starts with, uh, with grad students somewhere there, uh, writing up stuff for their own use during, for research and, and how it, uh, how they stuck to this very idea of having it. So it's, it's kind of neat. But, uh, let's get to the subject matter. Uh, so, uh, NumPy and SciPy. Well, SciPy is scientific Python, and it's a library for scientific computation, which uses NumPy as uh, its basic, uh, shall we say, engine, the, the basic data model under it. So it's a, uh, it's there. What's in SciPy? There are functions. There's lots of goodies that I don't really use, but since it's listed on the website, I I, I list it here. For oh no, I do do use statistics, but there there are methods for optimal. Uh, optimization for integration, image processing as well, which is kind of a little bit up my alley, and more. Just go there and see. Uh, by the way, the website where you can find both NumPy and SciPy is SciPy.org. Uh, and then there's uh, some rather unfair comparison. So no Python equipped with NumPy is not MATLAB, not quite. And it's not R either. Does everyone know what R is? Uh, those who don't, lucky you. Uh, and, 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 and honestly, I always like it much better, uh, Python and NumPy, than, than any of the, the other two, really, especially R. Uh, so, so the, the way I started with, uh, with NumPy is that, um, um, uh, I was doing some prototype, some, what should we call it, algorithm, uh, algorithm research or algorithm work, and I needed a prototyping tool for, uh, fit, finding little things on images. That's what I do most of the time when I work. And uh, it just turned out to be perfect as a as a prototyping tool. I've never honestly used it for uh, uh, really heavy mission critical stuff, but I've written lots of things in it that ultimately led to uh, commercial products here and there. So, what can we do? Uh, that will be mostly about. Uh, Oh yeah, the presentation will be mostly about NumPy itself and, and what you can find there. So I'll try to give you a little bit of an overview what can be found there. And then I would like to show you how I applied it to, uh, to actually a real life project uh, about which I'll talk at length as well. Uh, so, uh, what you can do there, those basic operations, you can create an array and oh, I have a pointer, hang on. Uh, so you can create, a, so that, that's how it looks like, right? You can, you can very well use it from, uh, from say, for 
from IPython, you just type in uh, import anti uh, import uh, NumPy, right? And you can use it. And uh, that's, for instance, an instruction for creating a matrix, a zero matrix, five by five, right? You can access, and then uh, the NumPy fully subscribes to, uh, shall we say, Python way of doing things, accessing uh, uh, numbers and or elements under indices by slices, by by indexing and so forth. So, for instance, um, so you can access elements at indices, and this is how it looks like, right? I'm comparing it. I'm comparing something to zero. That's not a very good way to compare anything to zero, but kind of shows the point. Um, uh, we can access entire rows. So this is this is my uh, uh, my my matrix, which uh, happens to be uh, um, n by n plus one, because that's from called the L show in a moment that uh, solves a system of linear equations uh, by the typical means. It's an illustration only. But the point is the point of this little example here is that I swap rows. So I have a matrix of numbers and just swap rows, right? So you just, just do it like you would do naturally by by two uh, as if they were variables. So uh, that sort of tells you something about how the library works. You can assign something to a uh, to a row and it becomes that row, right? As long as the dimensions agree. So you can use this whole uh, system in a very natural way. Uh, a little bit, I would say, MATLAB-like. So it is a convenient, uh, shall we say, a common line tool as well, for that reason. Uh, so we can access, uh, we can we can slice and dice things. Slice and uh, by the way, these are not only square matrices. All my examples are square. Uh, so sorry, these are not only two D uh, two D matrices. You can have arrays of arbitrary number of dimensions. Uh, for the record, I'm not using that in any of the, uh, that in any of these examples, but it's fully possible. So, um, can we, for the other the other trick that I'm doing here as well, I create a bigger array, and then that happens to be all zeros, and then I, I assign to a block of it, just this block, ten by ten in the top left corner, right? Uh, once, that's how it works. Why not? So I can assign one to another, and then there is basic arithmetics on matrices directly, so I can. Take a, I can I can take an element and compute something from the end. That's pretty obvious. But then I can compare. I can uh, I can assign. Well, I can multiply a row by a scalar and assign it. Right? That that works. So that's 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 more or less that's more or less how it works. Now I'll uh, I'll go on to my first example about uh, NumPy, and that's uh, the little piece of code that I typed up yesterday. Yes. Uh, I'm not sure I follow the question. I don't think that would work, actually. Uh, not at all, because this is this is an object that exists. Some, I haven't tried that, honestly, though. But uh, from, from, did you try? Uh, from, from the smells it makes, it probably wouldn't work. Uh, because you are accessing same object twice, so that would be, this would really boil down not to two assignments, but two invocations of a method on the same object. So that's not something that you want to do, really, is there? Um, but I don't know. Um, so uh, here's a little bit of an example that uh, I would like to use to show you how that all works. It's it's a pretty trivial example. It's. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a little function that, as I said, I, I, I wrote up uh, yesterday as an example to, to uh, it solves a system of linear equations by uh, using Gaussian elimination. So that's like high school stuff, I believe. And everybody's familiar with that, but I'll talk through uh, Python applications anyway. So uh, here's the first thing. So we take, uh, we take, uh, so, so in case, well, the equation is given as a matrix, as a square matrix, which I don't verify here, and a, and a vector, right? And uh, well, what's the first thing we do? Uh, we kind of tuck, attach the uh, vector to the matrix, which we can conveniently do using the function h stack. 
which means horizontal stacking. So I concatenate the two, attaching that very vector to the end. Now I'm ready to do my, uh, to, to convert my matrix into, uh, uh, in, into triangular matrix, right? By, by the process of Gaussian elimination. So that's what this function does. And this is where those little examples that, 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 that I, little snippets of code that I use for flipping rows, for instance, this is where they come from, right? So here is my, I mean, everybody knows how it works, so I will not go into details, but we use conveniently here all those little uh, bits and pieces that my slide has shown. And then we do it the other way around, because I thought it would look nicer and be shorter. And that's how it looks like in the end. Um, oh yeah, there's, there's, uh, there, are, there are two return functions that do pretty much the same thing. They, they, they sort of demonstrate, uh, uh, th this, is, this is basically the same instruction, but just using a different facility of Python. If I flip to the uh, to slides, and uh, oops, where it is. The, a, a rather fundamental or rather important feature of uh, NumPy is so-called UFUNCs or uh, universal functions, uh, which uh, bring all sorts of uh, arithmetic operations, element-wise operations, mind you, on uh, matrices. So we have the, um, just to clarify, I, I'm trying not to uh, confuse the issue, but we have, we have the algebra uh, set of, uh, uh, well, algebra sublibrary, which is quite important, which I'm not really talking about here, and then we have all things that relate directly to uh, matrices as essentially a data structure for accessing rows, columns of numbers, right? So uh, you, you most of the most of the time they really apply uh, to elements within a structure. So you can do element-wise multiplication, take two arrays, and you, can, uh, you, you, for instance, can multiply each element by each element into arrays, or you take uh, two arrays, there's a function called max, right? You take, or maximum, you take two arrays and it returns you from these two arrays max element-wise. So from each element it will take the biggest, uh, from each array it will take the uh, bigger of the two, right? It compares two matrices. So uh, this is what makes it a rather convenient tool for things uh, that are not quite algebraic, but more like, say, image processing or experimenting with images, because these are things you would normally do. Well, not quite, but you would do occasionally. So going back, uh, going back to my example, so one is a, uh, a rather, uh, so the, the, the first, uh, what the first line uh, uh, shows, or is intended to show, is uh, that I can use quite easily, I can, well, I mean, that, that's really done uh, as, as, as a, uh, as least comprehension. So I just process elements using indices from the list and then in one call I turn my list into an array, right? That, that's clear what it does, right? I, I, what, what I do, I produce list of numbers and I, I turn it into an array by one call. Uh, so my intention was to show, okay, we can interface two lists in Python and create arrays out of them, right? Here's the, uh, NumPy way of doing same. What I really do, I take uh, the last uh, column of uh, AY and the diagonal of AY, which is n by n plus 1, and divide uh, one by the other, right? Since I've done elimination before on this, on this data set, my, my, my matrix really looks kind of like, I don't, oh, there's, there's stuff there. Like, do I have a... Uh, no, I don't. Sorry, it has a diagonal and, a, and, and one row, and one column at the end. That's how it looks like. So you kind of can uh, can imagine what is it for. So it's pretty simple. Now we can run it, and if uh, if it doesn't, I'll be like totally embarrassed now. Uh, but it does. So it should. Uh, <laughs> I'm, so there you go. It solved my uh, randomly generate. Okay, thank you. Very nice. It's too late though, but thanks. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> All right, uh, now no, seriously. So uh, there, there you go. I'm lucky because uh, uh, well, I got the same result twice, which is very nice. So I'm comparing myself to 
uh, Python's linear algebra uh, module that has all goodies for doing this sort of things. So yes, uh, you can type up uh, a um, reasonable uh, way of solving linear equation in about uh, equation in about 15 minutes. Uh, that make it 30. But the point is, it's really easy. It's really quick, and all the stuff that you need to deal with. Uh, it goes away. Of course, typing up this takes about 10 seconds. So I, I strongly recommend using a library. And you don't have to test it. Uh, so that's um, th that much for, for the first example. Um, so what else is in the, uh, in the library that can be of use or of interest? Uh, so well, I went through UFUNCS. Uh, there's, there's, there's lots of stuff. Well, there's several form of uh, a fast Fourier transform that's uh, that's there. You can interface to another library very conveniently. Like for instance, you can implement you can interface to PIL. Uh, does everyone know what PIL is? Now PIL is a really really dated library. It's called Python Imaging Library. I don't really think it changed since four or five years ago a lot. So it kind of but but someone someone keeps it shall we say, compatible with subsequent versions of Python. Uh, but there, there's no real development. On. But it's, an, it's a useful library that I use to open images, really. That's not much else, really. But it loads, it loads images for me. So I open an image and convert it in an array, mangle the array. So uh, what I'm doing here is uh, pretty obvious. I'll show you this example. But what I, what I really do is I well, I take a, a fast Fourier transform uh, of my input image, right? And then I multiply it by itself. I, I take the square of it. I shift it all by one, all values, uh, to not to have pesky zeros, of course. And then I take logarithm of it to make for nice visual effects, scale it. Uh, you, will, you will have to see the visual effects. Uh, <laughs> And then I, uh, then I rescale it to whatever I expect to have in my, this is an 8-bit image that I'll produce, so I rescale, rescale it to uh, between 0 and uh, 20, uh, to, uh, um, 255. And then I make an image back from an array, right, from that array that I rescale, and save it out. So what I've done, well, I have created, I have computed so-called power spectrum, effectively, and took logarithm of it. Uh, the logarithm is really, as I said, for visual effects. So I'll now try to run this thing for you. You will see it, it runs actually, oh, this is a really nicely, nicely written C library underneath. So this thing, if used correctly, is blazingly fast. I mean, NumPy. But anyway, uh, what's going on? There, done. No, not done. But oh, okay, done. So uh, I loaded what I've done in that split time. And the, 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 what's, in, what's here corresponds really to uh, 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 to what you saw on the slides. So th there isn't much to add. But um, uh, so in this in this time, what what NumPy and Peel have done for me is I loaded an image that happens to be 800 by 800, uh, done the power spectrum computation, and written out the output. I'll show you the image and I'll show you the visual effects so that you can appreciate the hidden beauty of, uh, uh, okay. Uh, hang on, hang on, I'll be right with you. <laughs> yeah, that's my summer house. <laughs> Everybody's invited. Uh, <laughs> hang on, where, where, where did I put it? Uh, oh boy. Yeah, that's here, I think. So since it, I, I put it in the same directory, I, I have now a hard time uh, uh, finding it. But that's, that's okay. Yeah, that's right yeah, it's right there, but uh, normal Microsoft viewer doesn't doesn't show it correctly. So now I need to also find a decent viewer somewhere. Uh, uh, sorry. Yeah, well, you know. I have a love and hate relationship with Microsoft Windows, I have to say. I use, love part is when I get paid for using it uh, by my customers. Uh, 
Okay. So I'll load that image. So this is this is my uh, this is my source, shall we say? So this is an uh, th this is a, an image that has that I made by myself. Uh, it speaks a lot about my artistic abilities. Did you see, if that was in color, it would be a real Pollock. Uh, but the point is, though, it has really regular features to it, right? It, it's a fairly regular, you know, thing. You can accomplish that by uh, painstakingly painting little circles or using copy and paste. I've done the latter. Uh, now, if you uh, if your image is fairly regular, you can expect your where is this image? Jay? Um, you can expect your power spectrum to look uh, interesting, which of course it does. So that's the uh, logarithm of the power spectrum of of uh, that image. There, there's some saturations, but that's how it looks like, right? So. Uh, uh, it tells you something, if you analyze the sort of image, it tells you something about the regularity of features in the image itself. Uh, that's about it. Um, nothing much to see. Uh, but the point is, it's kind of pretty, right? I like it, but I, it's better than I expected it, actually. Uh, you pardon? Uh, of course not. <laughs> Why would I use Photoshop? I mean. Yes. Big pen, big pen. Uh, yeah, I don't need it. You're correct. It came from something else. Sorry, I, I, I don't need it now. I mean, I, I take uh, right later. I take the uh, square. Yes. Um, okay, so uh, did I mention R before? Yes, I did. Uh, and uh, R is, uh, for those who don't know, it's just awesome and everybody hates it, but it truly is awesome. It's incomparable to anything else set of statistical tools. Now, in uh, Python, we do have a bit of it, but not nearly as much. However, if things that, just like me, you do, tend to be pretty simple, uh, Python and NumPy with, uh, well, SciPy will serve you rather well uh, in doing basic stuff. For instance, if you want to generate random numbers, lots of random numbers, there is quite a selection of generators that match your uh, textbook pretty well and uh, there you go. You can use it for that reason. So now I'll talk a little bit of a project in which I used uh, uh, NumPy to generate test images. So uh, I'll, I'll skim. Okay, uh, that's the end of the part where I talk about where I introduce uh, NumPy. Did you, are there any questions regarding that part? No. Okay. Uh, am I totally boring? You are very kind, thank you. Uh, you can, we can get through this only together, really. <laughs> I'll be brief, you will be generous. Uh, okay, so uh, why, would I never do, why would I ever do it? Why would I generate test images? Because software that I worked on, uh, it measures those little, little things on images. Those little, little things that I, me that I talk about, they really correspond to images of cells. So if you take a microscope and uh, connect a digital camera to it, and you make take pictures, so this microscope has, has, has rotating wheels uh, on which filters, color filters sit. And then you get monochrome images from your, uh, from your sample that first was marked, of course, with uh, fluorescent um, uh, media of sorts, right? Fed to those cells, they, they incorporate it. So you end up having a, a bunch of images from this that kind of look like this. That's your nucleus, and it's uh, marked with one fluorescent stain that normally would correspond to light that you don't see. But, but well, it would be there. Uh, then it would be something in nice green color that would correspond to, for instance, I'll give you examples, that corresponds to cytoplasm, right? 
and then you would have a third image, again acquired at different wavelengths, where you would see, say, a bunch of dots around this uh, particular target, which correspond to, I don't know, a pattern of expression of something or, or, or uh, some, some organ else that just happened to be there. They incorporate this, so th this, this stuff that, that you feed them, so, and they're usually like antibodies that mark something. I'm not really strong on details, but there's a fluorescent moiety on the other end. So we get this sort of peculiar looking images uh, that if you compose together, they make a color image of a cell that kind of looks like a cell, but we analyze it in that form because that's that's really uh, the way to go about it. That's you know we, they're not there to look at them; they're there to measure processes that occur in those cells. So the problem with uh, with with this sort of work is that you want to test your software, uh, or you don't want, but you are required to. I mean that that really depends how you look at this. Um, the, the, the entire point is that um, if you go through the entire, these are living things really, living cell cultures, if you go through entire process from sample preparation uh, all the way through analysis to uh, some sort of um, uh, output that it's uh, interpretable by a biologist, so you can, const uh, you can contrive the sort of testing pattern where someone prepares a sample with known uh, cells and known stuff applied to them, and they would sort of expect a given type of response. So you can you can validate this entire process if that works. But the problem is that it, com uh, it really confounds so many factors that you can't really figure out on the basis of it what is not working and is really your software measuring things that you would think it should be measuring, right? It is really extracting the numbers that you want to extract, and this is really segmenting correctly the shapes that you want to segment. So, this objective truth is really, really difficult to attain. So instead of trying, we just give up and fake it all the way. So, what do we do? Well, so that, that's pretty much the summary of what I said. So this is a biology. We apply some chemical compounds, take pictures, Digital images are, well, here's kind of empty space. Something happens, and then bang, you get data. And then you compare it to what you expected. That's, that's sort of how people tend to, do, to look at this. Uh, but of course, it's, um, the, the issue with writing software in this way, I mean, so you, you sort of make some assumptions about, your, uh, about, about those images that, that will be coming in. You write your software. Then you get the actual images, you feed it to that software, and, 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 and you get some results, really. So how do you start it? How do you comment? And once you actually have working software, then you can sort of bootstrap yourself, right, in the old good way of, uh, uh, of, of uh, regression testing. You just assume your version 1 is correct, and then you test against that, unless a bug is found, and then you fix it and you assume that uh, version 1 plus delta is the correct version, and then you test against that. Uh, that's really not that good, really, is it? I mean, it's okay, but it's not perfect. No, actually, it sucks, but that's what you have to do. Anyway, the point is uh, that um, uh, in design, when you start, so you start from writing your software in, uh, well, you conv convince people that, are good, that have good will, uh, towards you and you get some data from them in form of those images and you feed those images along with your prior knowledge into creating the software and then you release the software, you listen to sounds of dissatis dissatisfaction which tend to be pretty loud at the beginning, especially from people who actually pay for the crap and then uh, you iterate and you iterate and you iterate. So uh, how is that we can um, uh, Where's the, where's, where's the problem with that? So, so the part of, of, of all that is that when you get your real life images and you make a lot of assumptions about uh, what's, uh, uh, how, how representative they are um, of what uh, your software is going to encounter in the future, really. So uh, I just say that uh, implicit assumptions are bad. 
uh, it's better to make explicit assumptions. So, how do we make explicit assumptions? Well, we assume something about characteristics of the images explicitly, and we write a, a simulator, a generator of fake images that, uh, that, that has certain parameters, and just we create this, this, this fake data according to um, what we think should be correct, but at least it's explicit to, 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 a, uh, to a range. There are always problems with sort of models. You must not allow yourself to believe in them, but it sort of helps you focus. That's why this software is, sort of software is useful. So, uh, for instance, we're making images by hand to, uh, so how you can test it? Well, you can, uh, you know, still going at it. You can make some, uh, some, uh, uh, test images with known values by hand and test against that. Okay, there should be value of seven here. Is it seven? Yes, good. Eight? No, that's bad. And, you know, that's, that's how we can go about it. Uh, there is, there is, there is a problem associated with, with the, uh, uh, with acquiring the slave labor necessary to uh, create this sort of images. Um, people don't want to do it. Nobody wants to do it. Um, so, uh, even if you pay them, they don't want to do it, and we are poor. Uh, so, uh, what do we do then? Well, we, uh, we, w w what I try to do is that, um, uh, we basically, uh, take example from real life images, assume certain things about them, and make artificial images out of this, shall we say, knowledge. So how that really works now, how, how is what this stuff does. I, I'll show it in a moment. I, I can't really run it because it runs forever, uh, really. It, it takes a long time, but just believe me, it works, and it uses Python, and it uses it in a quite nice way, which I will kind of step through a little bit. So how that really looks like. So we really have, you know, what, what that software gets is a container. So it's, I mean, in, in real life, these are actually uh, containers called whale plates. So there's a whole plate of little containers in which those cells normally reside. And, and you know, in, uh, on the image, it sort of corresponds to uh, uh, this, this sort of picture. You have a round shape or square shape within which some sort of objects live really. And my test image, ultimately, my, my real life images over there, they, they normally uh, uh, contain, they nor in their scope, there, there's tens of cells or hundreds of cells, depending on magnification, but the whole point is that this, uh, this container gets divvied up by the microscope, so we, we kind of look at a given position in the well, and then move a little bit, take a picture, move a little bit, take a picture, and this whole bunch of of, of images that sort of overlap a little bit, you need to stitch them together. That's another step in the process. So, uh, what I really do, so within the chosen container shape, code randomly places shapes drawn from uh, predefined object populations, which have their intensities, or rather concentrations, hypothetical concentrations of this fluorescent agent, uh, and uh, their shapes. I and they, you know, imagine for the for sake of simplicity, they are uh, they're, um, uh, elliptical shapes like that. So you have two, uh, really, two axes to decide. So, so you can kind of model them as, uh, as, as a, as a uh, this sort of uh, distribution, right? And they can be bigger, smaller, and so forth. They are drawn from this resolution, from this distribution. You place them in this container. Then you render part that's visible in the camera step by step, generating um, an array, really, of values in NumPy. So uh, to do that, I use NumPy and another nice library that probably nobody heard about. It's called Shapely. Uh, I, it, it's sort of d difficult to, uh, uh, to do, but it's the best I found. It's, it's, uh, it has its own problems, but it's, it's a GIS, actually, library uh, that has uh, lots of uh, shape things, so you can do operations on shape. Why I needed this is because I needed to figure out quickly uh, if I need to cut something or not, right? So writing my own code for actually uh, figuring out clippings uh, at the edges of these things is kind of unpleasant, really, and why would I do it if there's a perfectly good library, once again called Shapely, and it's available from 
the uh, general Python library repository. Uh, you can find it there. So there's a perfectly nice library to do it, so I use the library. <sighs> and then, having done that, I get, for instance, for this little square, I get my three images, and I mangle it them further, because then the real... So here, I, I sort of have a list on the side, on my software, that tells me, in this image, what I should really found. I should found... I should, I should, what I should find. I should find this shape and that shape and that shape, but they have this sort of intensities, blah, 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 blah. These are known, all known values that I can now automatically compare against, right? Just, that's not a very insightful test, mind you, but it's a, it's a rather rigorous test of, uh, uh, exercise, for exercising this sort of software that just computes or measures something from a real life detector. So now, I also have some other problems to account for uh, that tend to bother this sort of, sort of software. And these are, uh, these are problems associated with the actual physical, uh, mm, with the actual physical detector, right? the camera that measures this stuff. Because this sort of camera has, is subject of so, all sorts of uh, uh, noise, all sorts of problems that are known most prominently their integration noise or shot noise dark current and uh, uh, possible detector defects and uh, uh, um, our software and this is more by the way the main point of parameterization because our software should be robust in regard to this sort of effects within chosen limits and that's actually usually when you write software like it's given in the specs what sort of effects should you what's, what sort of level of effects you should uh, have you will have in your instrument right the one that you work on so uh, Dark current, and th these are inter interesting things that are related basically to how a camera is constructed, right? You have a camera like that one, and it's an electrical device, and there's, it basically has, captures electrons, really, well, it captures well, uh, photons incoming, they bump off electrons, and the electrons are being, uh, electrons are being captured, right? But the, the problem with this sort of a detector is that it's kind of warm. So there's a level of thermal activity in it that, well, it's, it manifests itself as, uh, electrons jumping on and off. Uh, so this is your so-called dark current. Uh, some level of background noise that's always there, right? And that's, that relates to the very nature of light, right? And then there are other problems. Well, so we add the noise and NumPy is excellent for create, for taking a massive matrix corresponding to an image and just creating a numbers, uh, uh, putting random numbers drawn from a certain distribution like, for instance, Poisson, to that matrix. And that's what I do here. And then we output it using peel to images that then get sucked into the software. Ta-da! Finished. Um, now, <laughs> if someone has patience to uh, look through the software, it's, it's, it's there. I can show it. I discourage generally because it's really boring. <laughs> I think know what I've done. But... Um, it's a, it's a pretty, uh, okay, uh, it will reload. I should have done it earlier, but um, I'm at the end, really. I'll just show quickly call, uh, the code, and if there's something of uh, particular interest, I'll point it out. It will take no more than uh, three minutes or five minutes, uh, and I have still 20, so if anybody has any questions, I'm really uh, more than willing to answer them. If nobody, then we are almost done. Think up some questions, people. I'm, <laughs> I feel underappreciated now. Beg your pardon? You know what? I don't think it's you. Uh, I don't think it's you. Uh, NumPy itself is using LAPAC. I don't think so. No. I, uh, although uh, SciPy does use LAPAC. So. Uh, I mean, when, when you look about, when you think about what's in NumPy, it's really simple stuff. There's no uh, ambitious math there. It's a matrix representation that is really, really nice and useful in Python, and you can use it for all sorts of things that don't have any mathematical flavor to it. It's just a bunch of numbers. By the way, it interfaces very well to a database called, called HD uh, database like thing called HDF5, uh, 
uh, there's a Python library called PyTables to do exactly that. And that's, that's a data storage system for this sort of massive numerical data. Uh, comes highly recommended. I tried to use it once. Uh, it's okay. <laughs> um, so, um, so what, what, so I mean, do I do anything, anything particular in here that, that merits mention? Well, I take real life sample shapes. Um, and I create my pipeline that draws these little shapes. I don't know, there's nothing there. I mean, no, that's it. It's really simple. Then, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a real application of Python, and Python and NumPy make it really so simple. There's a little bit of labor involved, but you don't have to go on tongue and, you know, contrive clever stuff. It just works. Uh, thank you. Oh, thank you.